All right. Um, welcome, everybody. We're really excited to have you tonight. This is our second um, Pro Step Refresher course, and we will be recording tonight's webinar as well. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, all of you will stay on mute. We do have the chat function where you can go ahead and put your questions, as well as we had some great questions submitted throughout the registration process as well. Um, we are joined uh, tonight by Dr. Pete Mangone, and he's going to be presenting on um, our new solo procedure guide. So he's going to go ahead and start. And like I said, you can put those um, questions in the chat. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, appreciate uh, Stryker giving us the opportunity tonight to uh, uh, feature the, the MICA solo procedure guide and the opportunity to go over the uh, MIS MICA procedure. Uh, I realized uh, I didn't even put my uh, name on the title slide. For those of you who know me, great. Those of you who don't, my name is Pete Mangone. I'm orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon in Asheville, North Carolina, and was involved in bringing the MIS uh, um, procedures over uh, from Europe uh, about six or seven years ago now. And so uh, I have a fair amount of experience. So hopefully I'll be able to carry some of that over to everybody on the, uh, on the webinar. So just a disclaimer, I am a paid consultant for Stryker. Um, the opinions are, are my opinions, not necessarily Stryker and the data is owned by myself. Um, this is not Stryker's data. Uh, sorry about that, somebody's coming in. Yeah, if you could, sorry about that, I'm at my office. I apologize, someone didn't realize I was in here. So um, so just, you know, we've seen this before, but just briefly, um, we're gonna talk for about 30 to 40 minutes or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. Obviously, MIS has gone through some evolutions. Uh, initially, the, uh, the initial procedure done, uh, without any significant uh, uh, fixation. Uh, subsequently, uh, modifications came to the second generation, which was more toward using pins. Um, again, problems of delayed and non-union, AVN, pin complications. And then in 2011, uh, Redfern and Vernoir really uh, kind of revolutionized the process by moving toward uh, combining uh, principles of MIS with uh, small areas of soft tissue dissection and, uh, and osteotomy uh, procedures, but at the same time providing rigid internal fixation, which really revolutionized the, uh, the process, enabled us to have more success. But at the same time, currently, the, the current technique is still relatively freehand. If you look at most other anatomic areas where we do more cuts, we do so with, with systems, with guides. And here's you know, just an example of a, of a total knee cut guide from, from Stryker in 2015. But you know, they've been using total knee cut guides for a long, long time. Uh, we're still doing things freehand. So what do guides provide? They provide more accurate cuts, more predictable cuts, and more reproducible cuts. So I would argue at this point, the MICA procedure solo guide really is carrying us into the fourth generation of MIS. And the fourth generation of MIS is not just small incisions and using internal fixation, but procedure specific tools and guides to help make the procedure more accurate, more predictable, and more reproducible. So, and more importantly, this is a procedure guide. So you'll find that this is substantially different than just a targeting guide, right? A targeting guide allows you to shoot a screw in a certain direction. What we really have developed here is a procedure guide that allows you to, to after you make your cut, to, to hold the cut, translate the, the head, make sure it's angulated the way you want it, turned and rotated the way you want it, and then not only shoot screws that enable you to hold the fixation, but also then perform even additional cuts after that to take off the medial uh, eminence and things of that nature. So it really emphasize the emphasis here is that this is a procedure guide. And I think that's really what makes it different than other guides on the market, which are truly just targeting guides, essentially trying to help position screws. So the, the benefits of this uh, procedure guide include a controlled adjustable shift, it allows automatic targeting of the screw trajectories. It allows stabilization, most importantly, of the head fragment in all three planes, translation, rotation, and displacement dorsi, dorsi, dorsi plantar flexion. And so you can control all three of those elements. And that's really what makes difficult is when patients are, when people are trying to do that with one hand. Also important, it's radiolucent. It allows you to see those guide pins quite easily and it allows you to basically it acts as your assistant. Rather than having to have a, that extra hand, it acts as that extra hand in the 
the operating room to allow you to do what you need to do. So the fundamentals of the, the MICA in general, we try to do a, a slightly modified Chevron osteotomy. It's not your classic 60 degree Chevron osteotomy. It's really just a, a, a what I call a obtuse angle um, and a, a shallow Chevron. What that Chevron does is that plantar limb gives you just a little bit of extra rotational control when you shift that uh, head over. It, it allows you to do some rotation, but at the same time, as opposed to a transverse uh, osteotomy, also allows you to get some additional control in, in multiple planes once the fixation's in position. Uh, the key to, to that little limb at the end is making sure that your hand is dorsal to the first MTP joint when you uh, perform the cut. Um, once we do that, then you, you have that displacement of the chevron and that displacement uh, of that distal fragment involves doing two maneuvers. One is pulling the first ray into, into varus and pulling the hallux into varus um, in order to prevent the head from rotating into a valgus type position. So you can see the difference on the left versus the right here, whereas this is in a more uh, a valgus type head position. This is, allows this to pull the toe back into a more neutral uh, head alignment. In addition, it allows you to rotate the head out of pronation. So those maneuvers are key um, to allow you to get the head in the correct position. And again, it's really a three-dimensional maneuver that's occurring. And this is what makes it difficult when you're doing it freehand is you've got to have some device in the first uh, metatarsal canal area to displace the metatarsal head and pull the first ray medially, uh, the proximal first ray. You have to derotate the toe out of pronation. And at the same time, you're having to pull the head back into a neutral to slight varus position in order to prevent that um, uh, osteotomy from going into valgus. And then what we don't have added in here is that you also have to prevent the head from dorsiflexing and plantar flexing. So you really have all these different things going on at one time, and that sometimes can be difficult to hold. So you often need that third hand, and that's why we really need a procedure guide and not just a screw guide. The keys to, to these first, the first mica, so again, going over the fundamentals, when we have that first mica screw or the, the wire placement, it's crucial to ensure that you have two cortices that are picked up by the guide wire. Ultimately, the proximal screw has to get both of these cortices, the proximal cortex and the distal cortex here, in order to have mechanical stability. That's really the key to the procedure. The entry point needs to be proximal in the first metatarsal base, if at all possible. Um, it's sometimes that's not possible, but in general, the closer you are to the proximal metatarsal base, the, the easier it is to have that, that um, area of cross cortex. And you'll see the third aspect is you really need to have about 10 to 12 millimeters proximal to the osteotomy in order to have enough stability. If you get any closer than that, you run the risk of breaking that, that um, uh, cortex, that lateral cortex. And if you break that lateral cortex, you lose that second uh, area of support and the osteotomy becomes unstable. So here it is after it's healed, you can see the proximal entry point, the distal entry point, you've got plenty of, of, uh, of uh, new bone formation after it's healed. Now the second screw really functions to just add rotational stability to the construct. It allows for earlier weight bearing as well. You have to be careful though, when you place that second screw, you wanna be careful not to go too far distal though, because if you're too far distal, it can, get in, it can interfere with you removing the medial cortex overhanging bone. Um, and that can result in that uh, screw becoming unstable or becoming prominent and needing to have it removed down the line. So that's typically been the most common complication I've had in patients uh, who, who, where I placed the screw a little bit too distal is the osteotomy remains stable, fortunately, but a lot of times that screw, probably about 10% of the time, I have to take that screw out because it's just prominent in that area of the foot. Um, looking uh, at the, the other object is to try and center the sesamoids. Um, this is no different than, than uh, open surgery, right? You'd like to, I, to try to recenter those sesamoids, and you do that with that rotational control. Uh, and we'll see how the guide enables you to do that. Uh, once again, the ideal screw position is you know, down the shaft, even slightly inferior in the shaft, because again, you've got a, a, a tension side on the plantar aspect. So if you can keep those screws, not uh, obviously you want to keep them in the cortex, um, but ideally if they're in the lower side of the, uh, the middle, that's better than, than higher. Um, 
in, in terms of the tension side. Now, the metatarsal head, there's a little bit better bone in that dorsal lateral aspect of the metatarsal head. So sometimes the purchase is better in that region. But anything in the shaft that has both cortices usually does well and is support and supports it enough. You can see again, kind of down the shaft here where those bones get the, the both cortices. I don't have the AP view, but they have the uh, both cortices on that. So we'll go over step-by-step. Step. How do you use the, the ProStep MICA uh, solo procedure guide? I'm gonna give you a little tips and tricks based upon um, my experience with the guide and some little things that, that there's still a little bit of, of play with the guide. We're working on that. There's gonna be some modifications and improvements as time goes on, but I think uh, it's really the best thing out on the market right now. So obviously the first step is that is that uh, shallow chevron osteotomy. You make that in your typical method. You're then going to introduce the tine into the uh, metatarsal shaft, and usually you're going to do that by having that tine go dorsally to begin with, and then slide in. It's much easier to come in from the dorsal side, and you're going to do that without the. There's a, a clip-on attachment here, which is the aiming guide portion, and you're not going to have that attached when you first attach that. Uh, guide. That gives you the freedom to be able to rotate the, the guide, get the tine into the metatarsal without uh, a problem. So once you get the hook into the uh, intramedullary canal, then the next step is to place the, uh, the proximal um, uh, guide into that, that, that aiming guide into the, uh, the assembly. And by doing that, what you do is you just rotate your hand out a little bit. It clips into place and it, it holds it right there. It can only go in one way. So uh, it makes it easy from that standpoint. You, it makes it a little bit dummy proof um, uh, from that component. So now you've got the, uh, the aiming guide starting in position. So once we have that, the next step is to actually start by, you'll have that metatarsal head centered on your, um, on your, uh, your, uh, the, the kind of the concavity of the guide. Now, one, one thing that I do that um, oh, we'll talk about here in a second on the lateral view is I usually put in a small pin just underneath the, uh, the guide in order to just keep it from rotating downward. There's a little bit of a tendency just because of the anatomy of the foot and the fact that there's a, an arch there for the guide to kind of rotate just a little bit inferiorly as you start to tighten it. So I'll usually try to get my alignment. I'll do an AP and lateral view. I'll, I'll, I'll get that lateral view and kind of draw that purple line on the foot. So I know kind of basic, my basic uh, lateral um, uh, uh, position. Then I line the guide up with that. And once I have that, I'll put in that pin. Usually it goes into the middle medial cuneiform and it just basically acts to allow the guide. So it's sitting here, like just kind of rests on, the guide can kind of rest on that pin and it, it doesn't go through the guide, it goes underneath it. And that prevents that guide from rotating downward a little bit. Um, but with that, once you get the guide into place, you've got the head in the concavity. The next step is to go ahead and, um, and start to translate just a, a millimeter or two. You don't want to translate a lot, just enough to kind of capture the head a little bit. At that point, you want to derotate the head and you want to derotate the, the toe and the head into supination. And oftentimes you have to, you have to overly supinate the great toe in order to get the head to come all the way around. And that's not just a procedure guide issue. That's the, the mica procedure itself. So once you have that positioned, you like the rotation. I do that under fluoroscopy so I can see where the sesamoids are. Once I like the position of the sesamoids, then I go ahead and place my guide pin, my two millimeter guide, uh, uh, K wire into either the dorsal or plantar um, uh, one of the two holes in the guide here, and that helps capture my fragment. And I like to go all the way through the second cortex because I think that gives better rotational control. So I'll go all the way through the, 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 the cortex. And then these, these K wires are specifically dorsal and plantar so that the, um, the screw should not hit them. If the screw is hitting them at some point, then, then the screw trajectory is off a little bit but I have not had that experience myself. So, so key, you derotate after you've had a couple of millimeters translation, you derotate. Um, and then once you've captured it and you know you're captured, you can then look on the lateral, right? And you can look and say, okay, I'm captured. Where am I? You can look at your, your dorsal and plantar position, right? You wanna make sure this is the benefit of that radiolucent guide. 
is that you can look at that position. You can say, okay, here's the head. Here's where my guide pins are going to go. If, you know, if you want to go up just a little bit further, you could raise that up just a tiny bit. And like I said, if I, if I had my medial cuneiform pin right here and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I want to, I want to be a little bit higher in the metatarsal, then I can just, you know, I can just rotate this up a little bit. And like I said, I put my little resting pin right underneath here. And I think in the future, we'll have a, a, a little area where that rests uh, in the guide to kind of help. But for right now, you know, you can use that pin and prevent it from, from rotating inferiorly. So once I know and I'm happy with that, then I can go ahead and, and start my translation of my uh, um, distal fragment. So I start the translation of my distal fragment and you use this thumb screw here. And as you tighten the thumb screw, it does two things. Number one, it starts to translate the first metatarsal proximal fragment medial while pushing the lateral fragment lateral. And so that's really key because uh, uh, when you turn this, what you're really doing is taking the slack out of the first metatarsal, um, uh, tarsal metatarsal joint. That joint is, you know, somewhat unstable. We know that that's part of where the origin of, of problems occur. We don't always know why it happens, but, but we know that Roger Mann, when Roger Mann described his distal and proximal chevron techniques, he actually recommended that the first TMT joint be pulled all the way into its furthest varus. And so that's essentially what we're doing in this point in time. That allows you to shift the head over just like we talked about. And as you can see at this point, we don't have to really mess with the, with the first, with the great toe. So traditionally while you're shifting the head over, you would have to be trying to twist the great, the big toe into that, into, into varus in order to prevent the head from rotating into valgus. In this situation, it holds it. And so you're able to uh, diminish the amount of valgus that's gonna occur at the head. Um, a single turn adjusts only about a millimeter to 1.5 millimeters of shift. So you can just take your time and, and steadily advance the, uh, the pin. One of the things I will say on this diagram, I will, will change as time goes on, and you'll see this on the next uh, film, is we wanna make sure that this tine is all the way down into the metatarsal shaft. So you'll see here, we really wanna make sure that tine is down into the metatarsal shaft and not sticking out three or four millimeters. That can sometimes change the trajectory of where the pins start. So having that tine all the way down is important up against this medial cortex. The other thing this does is it really allows for a more controlled shift. So as opposed to you know, really cranking on that, that medial cortex, which sometimes can occur when, you, when you, you're trying to shift the head more. In an elderly patient or somebody whose bone's not quite as good, it could potentially break out that medial cortex. This allows you to fine tune it much better. You don't have quite as much of that torque force while you're trying to turn the toe and position it and piston it. You can kind of gently move it over. So once it's over and in place, just checking my time here. Uh, once it's over and in place, um, then uh, next step is, uh, oh, here's that, talk, talking about that time, making sure you don't migrate that, uh, as doesn't migrate distally. So you want to make sure if that happens, take your tension off, replace it back down into that area, and then go ahead and start your uh, lateralization of the distal fragment again. And you can see here, this is, what, this is what I did in this particular situation. I backed off. I, I turned the knob in the opposite direction, took the tension off a little bit, pushed the tine fully back into the canal and then restarted lateralization and it did just fine. So once you've done that, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a, a proximal incision. Uh, you, you would start, you're gonna, you're gonna place the central, there's three different cartridges that you can push, put in this aiming area. So you're gonna choose the central one to start with. Uh, there's a medialized one and a lateralized one as well. And you'll make that adjustment based upon what we see with this targeting uh, trajectory component, which is really another great feature of this. So you assemble this, the chart, the, the trajectory cartridge, you put it into place, you put the 1.5 millimeter wire sleeve on there, you kind of line it up on the first metatarsal base. Now, again, if it looks like that first metatarsal base is not going to line up real well, then what you wanna do is change that trajectory a little bit. And so if it looks like it's a little proximal or a little distal, you can change the trajectory with this cartridge. And for instance, if, I, if it looked like I was gonna start a little bit too medial, I can then just put the, the medial cartridge in and it moves a couple millimeters to the medial side and allows me to start at this location. On the other hand, if I'm starting too distal, uh, if the pin looks like it's going to cross too distal, that allows me to then use the lateralizing 
uh, cartridge, which allows me to then move my, my entry point a little bit more proximal. So you wanna make sure that you, you fit that cartridge depending on where the sleeve fits and, and hits on that first metatarsal base. Then at the next step, we above that cartridge, or as part of that cartridge, there's a little tiny hole right in here for a 1.4 millimeter K wire. You'll place that 1.4 millimeter K wire. It's not in through the sleeve, but it's actually it's actually through the uh, the trajectory um, pinhole, and that will actually show you. You basically line that up. You have to line that up with the cartridge so you're, and, and with the guide. So it has to overlap, directly overlap on the x-ray. And once you directly overlap, then you know you've got a true AP. And you'll be able to see where is my, uh, where's my uh, head going to, where's the fragment going to go in my head? And again, this is another area where you can see not only the start point, you know, do I want to medialize or, or centralize or, or put it in more lateral, but where's it going to end? And so you can actually centralize you can you can change the trajectory and add a you know move it a little bit more lateral we'll move it a little bit more medial if you need to and you can make those adjustments before you start having to throw a k wire into the bone and before you start making holes in this lateral cortex uh, that just minimizes that you know i'm sure we've all been there when we've tried to throw the wire and it goes through we think we're in a good alignment and then you find out you're not now you've got you're trying to go through the same you try to go through a different wire trajectory and it keeps getting caught in the same hole. So this allows you to really plan out before you make that decision. Okay, this is where I'm going to start and this is the wire that I'm going to uh, throw. Um, and so you get that trajectory, you line it up, um, you start with that central and then you make your adjustments based upon that. So once you have your correct cartridge in place, you, you've you've kind of uh, had the, the trajectory selection that you want, you're happy with where it's going to go in the head. The next step is to then go ahead and place your K-wire. But you can see here, again, this was a situation where it was gonna to be too lateral for the, the wire selection. So uh, it, this is a situation where it's more in a, in a better position, right? So you can make those adjustments before you start throwing wires. This is actually the trajectory wire over top of um, the, uh, uh, the guide uh, through the small pinhole. This is not the wire actually going into the, uh, the body. The same thing here. We're lining this up and being able to tell where it is. So, so one thing that we have found is that there are times where, especially in a smaller foot, um, that sometimes that even with the most medialized trajectory, the starting point is still a little bit too lateral. If that's the case, what you can do is you don't need to take your, your pin out of your head. You don't need to take the tine out of here. If you just gently pull the, the, this instrument, just gently pull it away from the foot just a little bit. You can usually just slide down through a small incision and then get that guide directly on that uh, proximal first metatarsal metaphysis. And once it, it hits that proximal metaphysis, usually it stays there and it'll kind of grab it. Um, if, if you feel like it's still moving a little bit, then you can always throw your, your K wire just in there to capture it for a second. But that usually allows you to, uh, to overcome that. Again, I haven't seen that a lot, but on, on uh, one or two cases it's happened. And it's a really easy, simple thing. Just kind of pull it out, out just a little bit from the foot and you're able to get that starting point correctly. So you still get the benefits of the guide. You're not taking it all apart, but you're just making a fine tune adjustment. <clears throat> Next, um, you then place the 1.9 or the 0.9 millimeter wire sleeve. In, in an alternative world, I, I actually use the blue sleeve again. So I happen to pass two uh, 1.4 millimeter wires. You can do that as well, but that means you have to do an exchange down the line, um, which I don't have a problem with, but some people struggle with. So if you, if you want to, you can use two 1.4 millimeter wires and just use the, the blue guide a second time, or you can use the 1.9, like I said, I find, or, one, or the 0.9. I find the 1.4 just gives me a little bit uh, better um, uh, ability. It doesn't bounce sometimes off this, off this medial cortex right here uh, when it crosses. So there it is. You've got two uh, um, guide pins, and obviously these are two of the same size. Um, their trajectory, and then you can check your trajectory, although I'll be honest with you, it's not, I've not found it to be off, but I always check it. 
Um, and you can see here it is going right down the shaft where you want it. You can make sure that you're, you've got your lengths as to what you want from a length standpoint in terms of, of capturing the head. So again, translucent guide makes it very easy to see where your osteotomy is. You can see it's not dorsally or plantarly angulated or translated. You can see on this view, it's where you want it to be and it, it captures it nicely. So, so then you remove this, the, the cartridge sleeves. You can use your depth gauges to figure out you know, what's your depth on each of the individual screws. Um, don't forget to advance your, um, your K wires at that point. You want to advance them a little distal either. Sometimes I just put them into the proximal phalanx uh, temporarily, or sometimes I'll bring them out the bottom of the foot and capture them with a hemostat. But either way, it just prevents that, uh, that K wire from kind of coming back out once you drill. So you place the soft tissue protector, which we have a, a, a sleeve protector. You can put it over top of the uh, um, wire and then place the drill through that and drill your uh, drill for your first screw um, and then drill and place your second screw. So it, 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 you can do it right through the guy. You just basically take the cartridge out. You take that aiming cartridge out and you can go right in right through here. So you still have the, uh, the cartridge in position but you take that uh, inserting uh, that medial lateral central trajectory cartridge out and you can put the screws right through this without a difficult, without difficulty, just did one today. It's no problem. Um, and it, and it keeps your alignment while you're doing that. Theoretically, theoretically, once, you know, if you do struggle with that second screw uh, for some reason, or there's some space issue, once you get that first screw in, you could always take the guide off and, and you've, if you already have your K wire in place and, and place the, uh, and, you know, drill through that, but I find it works quite nicely to just use this. It keeps everything in position and helps hold the rotation. This is one of the greatest features, I think, of this guide, though. In addition to the fact that it fires screws routinely down the shaft and it and it routinely helps to uh, um, to get the, the the screws exactly where I want them on a regular routine basis, making it more accurate, and reproducible. But this if you recall the removal of the medial overhang or what some of us call the, the quote sharp corner. So in many cases, that is the most, can be one of the most frustrating parts of the procedure. You finally get your screws in, at least traditionally, you know, you might struggle to get screws in and you're thinking, I'm finally through it. Great. Awesome. This looks great. You get your AP and lateral view and then you're like, okay, let me cut this corner off. And that becomes maddening at times. And you're trying to get the right trajectory and you know do you come in from distal to proximal or do you go from proximal to distal and how do i try to avoid the nerve and it just can get a little bit frustrating you're you're kind of you think you're at the end it's maybe like when you you know trying to throw that distal interlock when you were first a resident and you'd get the rod down and you finally try to do that and you'd struggle with the distal interlock right so the same sort of thing here this guide really helps that dramatically so what you do in this situation is once you've, you've got your screws in, you can place your guide pin back down through your, your, your larger 4.0 millimeter screw. Place your guide pin down in there and then place your screwdriver, hex screwdriver back into the head. You're not gonna turn it or anything. You just have it without the handle. And then we've got this corner removal guide that slides over top of the, um, uh, the screwdriver. It goes in and locks into position and then trajectory wise, lines up right with this corner edge. You then basically place a K wire, place a guide pin through that area. Let's go back to this, place the guide pin through that area. You can then remove this guide, you remove the screw, uh, the screwdriver, and now you've got a, a guide pin position such that it will take off this corner edge. You then drill directly over that guide pin. So you drill over it, once you drill over it, now what you've got is you've got a hole, basically a four, a, a, about a 3.5, 3.0 millimeter hole right where you want to be in the, in the correct trajectory of what you want to do to take off that sharp edge. So now you can now slide into that hole with your burr and you can then do your cutting action, both dorsal and plantar in your typical fashion to basically take off that edge. Um, and you can either remove that piece or in many cases, I just push it into the, into the canal. It usually just pushes right into the canal and you can see how that just nicely fits in there and it makes the, uh, the medial side, you know, just nice and flush. It, it's, it's a very nice thing to have. It's, it makes that, that last part of the case when you're like, okay, I'm almost done. 
And instead of it taking another 15 to 20 minutes to struggle through it, you can get it done in three to five minutes and you're, and you're done. So it's really been a fundamental game changer, I think, in addition to the other aspects that we've talked about. Um, you can also, if you want to, if you, if you need to slide in here and, you, and remove any of the medial eminence, there are certainly times where some people just have a bigger medial eminence than others. Um, and, or they may have just a little bit of a dorsal medial uh, bunion, maybe from some mild arthritic just, uh, changes, and you can kind of slide in through one of the uh, incisions and take that down with a burr. I usually use the wedge burr for that, and then just make sure you wash it out real well. But I'd probably do that about 25% of the time, 75% of the time I don't need to do that. But 100% of the time I take this medial eminence off, this medial sharp corner, and that's been a huge uh, addition. So. There's your final construct, obviously, minus an Aiken, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're, we're really focusing. The guide really is to help with this metatarsal shift and the osteotomy that's there. Um, so, uh, so with that, um, you know, the, the final construct, you can see the, the two screws. What I do like, again, is that because obviously I did this before I took off this medial eminence, but is it does keep this, this second screw a little bit more proximal. It keeps it in a, in a relatively uniform distance. From the, uh, from the initial screw, instead of it being kind of a, you know, who knows, it might be a little bit angled this way, or it might be crossing that way, or it might be converging. It really keeps them at a uniform distance. In addition, it keeps them parallel in the lateral plane as well, which I like from that standpoint. Certainly, if you wanted to diverge them, if you're, if you're a person who believes in the divergence being better, then you can certainly freehand that second screw uh, if you'd like at any point. Um, but I think it works well. It provides uniformity, accuracy, reproducibility, which in my hands is really the best outcomes for my patients. When I'm doing things more routinely and regularly and not kind of every case is different, it allows for better reproducible results. Um, another example of the final construct where I've taken that, that uh, uh, sharp, sharp corner off. Um, I actually took a little bit of the medial eminence off. Sorry, there's somebody running outside here. Um, and then, uh, You've got the screw, the screws coming down, trajecting into the metatarsal head. So you can see the trajectory down through the, um, uh, in the shaft. In this particular case, this, this patient had a little bit more cavus foot. So I started a little bit higher trajectory. I think that is one thing to make sure. Um, I think one of the questions that came up beforehand or people asked was, they said they were having some issues with maybe missing with the second screw inferiorly. I think that's mainly because when that happens, what you want to be thinking about is that guide kind of falling down into the arch. So as you, as you tighten that, that um, uh, screw jack mechanism, the tendency is the foot is, is more full dorsally than plantarly. So the tendency is gonna be for that to rotate downward just a little bit and kind of fall into the arch. So again, I, what I do to try to prevent that is add that, that K wire just at the medial cuneiform level to kind of keep, the, the, keep it from rotating downward. You don't have to do that. You can also just be watching and making sure that as you're turning it, that it's keeping that, that same level, that same relationship and not rotating downward just a little bit. Because if it rotates downward and, and your starting points are down here, then you very well could, because remember the, the, the first metatarsal has this curvature to it. The base is actually larger than the, um, uh, than the shaft and your starting point really should not be, you know, right in the center or even inferior center, it should be centered to two thirds of the way up because that's really what lines up, sorry, what lines up with the shaft, right? Is really about that one third to two thirds junction is really what lines up with the shaft right here. If you're a little bit low, you're gonna end up shooting through the concavity right in this area and you could potentially miss on one of your uh, wires. So just be aware of that. It's really just a function of making sure that you stay in the true lateral plane of the first ray. Um, so with that, uh, just a quick case example. Um, and, you know, obviously I've got some experience with this guide um, and, and, you know, like anything, you, you, you learn little bits and pieces as you, as you use it. Um, and we're learning as we're going along and there are second generation um, changes being made that will be you know, hopefully coming out in the, the, the winter, fall to winter time, where we will have learned some of these little nuances that, uh, that uh, we've seen and being able to adjust for those. Um, but I think right now, without a doubt, even, even with those little nuances, 
it really provides the most accurate and reproducible meth method to do this procedure um, in, a, in a relatively hands-free fashion. So 63-year-old female, uh, obvious hallux valgus, uh, bunion deformity, uh, fairly significant. You can see here, here that I've, I've um, placed my guide pin in, I've translated, I've done my trajectory. This is my trajectory uh, kind of wire, and then I'll throw my wire over top of that. So after I've thrown the wire and I'm, I'm happy with that, you know, I'm starting really close, as close as I can to this base area. Ideally, you really don't want to be down here with your first K wire, right? You really want to be up in this area. That provides the most mechanical strength where you get good bone here, good bone here, and down into here. The closer you get to the distal portion, uh, the closer you have to throw your K wire to this edge here, and the, the more likely you are to potentially break out of your um, break out of your cortex or miss the miss the head laterally. And then again, if we look on the lateral, this radiolucent guide, you can see right down the shaft. I'm going right down the pipe. It's it's you you basically want to be in the center. You want to have the the first metatarsal basically centered on this radiolucent kind of graphite uh, plastic kind of component. You can see the head is centered. I'm up at this mid to, you know, I'm not, you don't want to be down here where that base is, right? You want to be at that mid to, to dorsal two thirds section and it's firing right down through that area. You can see that where I am in the head, okay, I know that I'm going to subtract a couple of millimeters from this so I don't go through the head with my screw. I can then place my second guide pin. Um, uh, I then went ahead and, and drill across that area, place the screw. And again, a nice construct here where two cortices um, and, and good fixation. And, and then we've got the, I don't have the AP view on this or I do on the uh, post-op, but uh, in intra-op, this is the intra-op view. Um, obviously I did a little second toe procedure here as well, but you can see substantial improvement compared to where the patient was preoperatively. Um, with, uh, you know, just five, you know, five small incisions. Um, and then, you know, here she is at six weeks post-op, uh, doing well, um, you know, uh, stable. She was very happy uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, walking and everything. So, you know, certainly some swelling as any of these patients have, but the trajectory is nice. It's, it hasn't moved. The, the position's good. We've got a good position of the metatarsal head in, in both planes. And it really shows that you can get this uh, trajectory in good fashion. So, so that's what we've got as far as we're at about 40 minutes, which is what I planned. So, um, so that kind of gives you an, an overview, a refresher on the guide itself, a little bit on the MICA procedure. And I'm happy to go ahead and uh, answer questions um, as we need to uh, about the guide and um, and about different aspects of its uh, use. So uh, fire away. I don't know, Jennifer, if you're on the line, if you want to read those off or. Yeah, perfect. So thank you. That was um, a really good overview of not just pro step Mika in general, but utilization of the solo guide. So we had one uh, question come over from Dr. Siddiqui. And the question was when starting MIS foot surgery, which, which procedure is best to start off with? And which patients would you select for hallux, um, MIS hallux valgus as your first few MIS cases? So I think uh, that to me, I think one of the best procedures to start with is the Aiken osteotomy. I, I think it works. It, it's a, it's a, it's an osteotomy that you can you can get into trouble if you don't use C arm on, but if you use the C arm uh, uh, well and you use it frequently in the early cases. It's a great procedure to learn hand position, to kind of really get a sense for hand position as to, okay, keeping my hand in the same place, you have to make a dorsal cut and a planter cut through a, through a central um, uh, pivot hole. Um, it kind of, uh, it relies on good technique in terms of having that supination, pronation kind of mo motion. And it really helps you to be able to keep your hand in that same plane. So, you know, I'm constantly looking at my hand and getting x-ray and, you know, where am I? What am I doing? Am I staying in that same plane? And you get that immediate feedback from the fluoro views. I'll fluoro often, often, especially early on when I started doing it. So I think the Aiken works, uh, works very well as a procedure that allows people to learn. And, and, and if, you know, it doesn't always have to be a big bunion correction Aiken. It could be a patient who maybe has a, a, a big toe with a hallux interphalangeus that's 
pressing on a second toe and causing a corn, and they don't need a bunion eminence resection. They just need a, 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 a proximal phalanx osteotomy, basically, to bring them out of valgus and out of how it's interphalangeous and allow that second toe some relief. So I think those are the, the best patients to start with. It allow, it gives you some, some um, experience with trajectory on your wires, um, kind of shooting in the center of the canal, learning the anatomy. Um, so all those things, uh, I think, you know, make it a good procedure to start with. That's my preference um, uh, from that standpoint. What was the second part of that question? Um, let's see. Um, yep, that was it. Which patients would you? Oh, okay. Yeah, and the patients, I mean, if you're going to, yeah, patients would be those, you know, for those starting procedures would be that. If, when you talk about a mica procedure, if you're going to do your first micas, it's better to do a patient with moderate level deformity very minimal deformity, I think sometimes is more difficult because the, the angle of the guide pins, if you, if you look at the, let's see if we throw up the, the guide pins here, you can see, you know, the, 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 the more the shift is, the, the easier it is to get the guide pins in the right position. If you have a very shallow shift, it becomes more and more difficult. So something that's gonna require a moderate level shift is I think a better procedure to do um, as a starting point. Perfect. Um, let's see, we have another one. So do you usually, usually use the same two by 20 burr as your osteotomy cuts? Um, or do you switch to the 3.1 burr in particular when you're removing the medial eminence? So I, I use my, uh, use the 20 millimeter burr for everything in the metatarsal. Um, I do use a 10 millimeter burr for the, um, uh, you know, 10 or 12 for the, uh, um, proximal phalanx osteotomy, but for the metatarsal, I used the 20 millimeter burr. And uh, at times I toyed around with the, um, with the wedge burr, the 3.1 millimeter burr. The problem is that that really is more of a grinding burr and not a cutting burr. And I think that increases the risk of capturing the nerve because it really wants to roll over the cortex. And so I think the cutting burr is the better burr if you can learn to use that cutting burr. And I do think that this guide um, like we talked about with the medial overhang um, resection really helps with that because now you're working from inside out. And that's really the best way to avoid damage to the nerve is by working from the inside out instead of trying to cut it from the outside in. Great. So these two, I feel like we can combine, um, but what is your post-operative course? And then when are you getting patients back into sneakers? So um, my post of course, so I, I could let my patients wait bare right away. And when I first started, I did. I actually keep them off of it for two weeks. I tell them that if they're kind of taking a step or two to get from the toilet or to a bed, to a chair, that they can put full weight on it. But in general, my patients, unfortunately, you know, sometimes when you say full weight bearing, they sometimes think that that means full activity. And so uh, I don't want them doing full activity out in the garden and things like that. They just come back way too swollen. Um, and so traditionally, I keep them off of it for two weeks, um, uh, you know, kind of limited weight bearing. Then at, at two weeks, I let them do 50 percent weight bearing. But again, I let them kind of full weight bear for smart, shorter distances. But again, it just really has to do with taking making sure people don't you know get out into the garden and do all these crazy things because they feel really good. They don't have a lot of pain. But unfortunately, they still have had an osteotomy. And, you know, if they just start, you know, trying to do all these aggressive maneuvers, they just get more swelling. Doesn't necessarily hurt, but the swelling takes longer, in my experience, to fully resolve if they swell substantially in the first three to four weeks. If they keep their swelling under control the first three to four weeks, then what I've found is those patients typically can get into sneakers between six to eight weeks, if not before then, um, sometimes earlier than that. But in general, it's somewhere between somewhere on average six weeks, you know, plus or minus a week or two either direction. Now, again, sneakers doesn't mean they're out, you know, playing tennis or doing three mile walks or things like that. I did have one woman who actually ran a 5K at 10 weeks after her procedure, which was a little crazy. Um, you know, she was very aggressive and she did fine. Her osteotomy didn't move, uh, but she did swell uh, and she came in wondering why she was swollen. Um, but, uh, um, but it, it held up and she did well and healed everything. So, um, so that's my traditional regimen. So we have another question around the osteotomy. So what's your favorite starting point in the metatarsal to start with your Chevron osteotomy with the burr? Um, and does it ever change based on the patient? 
so it pretty much doesn't change. Um, so my osteotomy starting point, let me see if I can find a, a good lateral view or AP view here from a standpoint of, um, here we go. So this one here, so my, let's see, pull it up here, I'm trying to get my, there we go. So my starting point traditionally is, let's see if I can uh, pull this back before I, uh, there we go. Um, I like to make my osteotomy just at that metaphyseal diaphyseal flare, just proximal to the metaphysis. So uh, I, I know there's some DPMs on here, but for the medical doctors or the, the, the orthopedists are on, those of us who have experienced placing traction pins in the distal femur, typically we were taught to place them just proximal to the flare. Um, and so, um, so if we, if we, we see this picture here, I would traditionally start at just proximal to the flare right in this region. And you can see where I made my osteotomy with just proximal to that flare. And that's where I like to do it. I think, you know, when you start getting up into the shaft, number one, you know, I don't think the shaft heals as well. Number two, it's just a little bit more unstable. Number three, you start to get closer and closer to this, uh, um, you know, shelf of bone that you want to keep uh, there. So, so traditionally, mine's just a, a millimeter or two off the metaphysis, and it generally doesn't change. Um, I haven't found it to be too different between you know in where I make the osteotomy in the individuals. Obviously, everybody's anatomy is a little different. Some people are more cavus, some people are more pes planus. Maybe the starting point of the wire might change a little bit, or how far I have to translate the head. Um, but the osteotomy itself is relatively the same. And I usually start on that kind of maybe again, that kind of not halfway, but maybe just above halfway on the lateral. And you want to aim just slightly inferior with the, with the first, you know, pass and then work upward from there. And then you want to have that, that kind of cut just a little bit of a, of a flare on the bottom with that short Chevron cut. Awesome. So one more question, and this is really, um, came up multiple times throughout the registration process. And I know you touched on it briefly in your slides, but um, the challenge of getting a true lateral and aligning the guide to um, the metatarsal um, and sometimes how the wires are going to plantar. So what's the best way to ensure the guide is in line um, in that lateral view? So you can see here, this is a great example because what I have up here is you can see this wire right here that's back on this. You can see my arrow that's in the medial cuneiform. That's this wire right here, right? And so what I typically will do is I will, you know, draw that line on the lateral side of the foot. You know, I pre, you know when I'm in the OR, we start first, get a K wire, put the line kind of down where, where is the, the mid shaft where I want to be the starting point, the ending point um, off my true lateral. Then what I do is I try to align the guide based on that, right? I try to get it, you know, so that I, I, I think I'm pretty close to where I want to be. And once I think I'm pretty close to where I want to be, I've got the, that cartridge kind of in place up against the medial foot right here. We've got the cartridge, you know, kind of right up against the medial foot here. I then, what I will do is I will place this guy, this K wire kind of in the medial cuneiform. And what that does is it basically acts as a, as a basement, right? It acts as a floor, for the um, for the guy, because up here at the at the metatarsal head, you're gonna you're gonna pin that, right? And that's gonna be relatively stable. The only thing here is, if you were to pin this, then then you can't rotate on the on the uh, the jig. So it kind of puts it in a difficult scenario where you you wouldn't be able to rotate if you tried to pin through the jig itself. So what I do is I place it a, a wire underneath there. It's kind of a rafting wire essentially to kind of hold that. Um, hold that guide there. Now, as I turn my crank and I move the head over, it won't have that tendency to fall into the arch. And so I really think that's the key. Uh, that's one of the keys and, and will be, I think, one of the, the modifications that we make is we're going to figure out how to uh, incorporate that into the process. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come through the chat. Um, thank you, Dr. Mango. And that was a an amazing presentation on the solo guide and really went through some tips and tricks too, since it's only been out for a few months here. Um, thank you everybody for joining. We also have a, another pro step refresher course coming up on July 26th at 7 PM as well. So be on the lookout for that invite. I hope everybody has a good night.
Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, please let the striker people know. We'll be happy to try to answer them, you know, at later times or, or you know, send emails as well. So uh, um, talk on the phone. I'm happy to try to help people uh, really believe in this. So thank you for your attention. And thank you, Jennifer and Stryker, for the opportunity. Thank you, guys.